of nerd paradigm, James, can you talk a little bit about, I know you used to enter computer contests. Absolutely. Feel Fan free to nerd out as much as possible. <laughs> yeah, fantastic thing we used to get into. Uh, still exist, but uh, all the way through college, uh, we were, uh, me and my roommate, we were both members of the ACM uh, back in school, and they got us started into some weekend programming contests. Mainly, it was, uh, you know, get a program, get a problem, get involved into it, and spend 72 hours solving it as much as you can. We continued that after school. Uh, the International Conference for Functional Programming, the ICFP, still hosts every year a 72-hour programming contest. Uh, and teams from around the world, from MIT, all the best schools, uh, Google, a lot of the larger companies compete in this. It's a pretty large uh, contest still nowadays. It's the same format. They release a problem to you at midnight on Friday. You have 72 hours to complete it, and then you get ranked on it, and uh, uh, you compete in it. So, yeah, after school, uh, me, Darren Kelkoff, Tim Chamberlain, and some uh, some other team members continue that for the next 10 years. Uh, it'd be a kind of a little vacation uh, of the programming contest every year, and uh, we're pretty proud of ourselves. Uh, we call ourselves the algorithms uh, after Al Gore uh, for <laughs> at, at the time. And uh, we were pretty happy. We was always able to place in the top half and a couple times in the top third. Okay. What was the best you ever did in that contest? Best we ever did was probably the second year into it. Uh, it was a genetic uh, AI algorithm we had to come up with, mainly to control uh, autonomous agents in an unknown world against uh, both competitors and uh, uh, entities of a dubious nature. Uh, so mainly you had to put together a very small working genetic brain to control uh, an agent out in the world to score points and to compete against other agents. Uh, I think that particular year we were in the top, maybe there was 200 teams, we finished maybe in the 30s. Uh, I, I know that one of the Google teams was on the same page as us in the results, so we were pretty happy about that. <laughs> so uh, your first job was the Sporting News, major job, mm -hmm. you left Carbondale. Did you get any like uh, pushback from your family at all, leaving college to go and? Uh, Absolutely, uh, father, again, you know, mechanical engineer, master's degree, uh, completed most of his doctorate, very interested in what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, you know, everybody could kind of tell at the time, 98, 99, there was definitely something magic going on. I and mean, this was, you know, just the ramp up to the dot com. You know, it, everybody knew if they could just get involved, they could make something pretty magical happen. So, uh, better or worse, uh, you know, he, he, he took me at my word, so, you know, this is something that I think is going to be different. Um, and off to St. Louis, I went. So, talk about that first job at Sporting News. Any highlights? What did you do? Absolutely, very interesting. Uh, so I got picked up by a recruiter and uh, went in, met with, um, one, ended up being one of my greatest mentors, Jason Kent. Uh, at the time, he was a superstar of uh, Times Media Company. Um, he, as unknown to me at the time, was only about 25 years old himself. Uh, he had been riding this startup wave himself. He's already a vice president um, at a very large uh, you know, traditional media company who's trying very hard to get into new media. Um, but met with him and a few other of the key players there, and they offered me the job on the spot. Um, mainly with my you know, background in web development, Linux development, and some, and some uh, different projects I've been involved in at the school. Um, they had no idea how old I was. Um, I was just 19 at the time. They thought, I mean, I guess uh, due to my size and so forth, uh, that I was closer to my mid-20s or so forth. Um, but they hired me and got started there. In the time, uh, they were at a critical stop or critical spot. They had um, a very large online presence already. They had been partnered with uh, AOL up to this point, and they had just dissolved their partnership with AOL, and they were taking their site and relaunching it by themselves. Uh, the technology platform they were running at the time was some very large, old SGIs, running some Informix database software, and they were literally stuck back in a closet. And nobody there really knew what it was. They didn't know the code. Um, what they had was a very large liability with nobody that knew how to work it, and they had to turn it into an asset as quickly as possible. They knew that I knew Linux, a little bit of database work, a little bit of web work, and with Jason Kent, our, uh, our vice president, they wanted to very quickly, as, as soon as possible, take that, redevelop it, and relaunch a site outside of AOL. Um, so that's what I got hired to do, was come in there, help them put together a strategy to move over to the Linux platform, which again, we're talking back in 98, 99, it wasn't a um, solid platform like it is today. Now, nowadays, somebody says you're running Linux, it's a, it's a no-brainer. Back then, it was still more of a risk. Everybody was running, you know, Iris, CGI, or uh, SGIs, HPUX. Solaris, obviously, was the uh, uh, 
the, the foundation of a lot of dot-com stuff. Uh, but we were moving it to Linux. Uh, we were working with IBM on their former database. We was one of the first production ports of that over to the Linux platform. And we had about six months to go from nothing to a complete rewrite of the entire content management system and the entire online presence for the Sporting News, which at the time was the second most popular sports site on the, uh, on the interwebs, internets. Um, so they hired me, not knowing exactly that I was 19 years old at the time, and uh, we just kind of dug in. Uh, again, this is a dot-com day, so it was fantastic. Uh, you know, lots of that, you know, just, yeah, I was drinking Diet Coke. Uh, Jason was drinking uh, uh, Mountain Dew by the case, night after night, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, and just burning through the code as quickly as possible. Uh, we got the site launched on time, got things moved over before the partnership with AOL completely uh, dissipated. Um, and it was really my first great victory, uh, realizing that if you just put your mind to it and get the right people, the right team, and just focus, you can accomplish some pretty magical things. So fast forward a little bit. You started your own company, MMLT Holdings. Mm -hmm. uh, what made you go out and do that on your own? Well, MMLT, uh, MMLT Holdings, terrible name, great little company though. Uh, through the last 10 years, after leaving the Sporting News uh, and working with the Lane family here in St. Louis, um, I, I've worked for them since 2002, and we started up several companies, uh, all focused on core technologies, leveraging that technology to enable other aspects of business. Uh, so not a pure technology play, but always using that technology to enable value add above and beyond the, the competitors. Uh, so we do a lot of e-commerce work, we do a lot of logistics work, uh, warehousing, uh, ERP work, uh, in some markets out in California as well as here uh, in the East Coast. Um, but through those companies that I, I, I'm with, I'm still with those, those guys as the, uh, the CTO today, we were having a lot of opportunities come to us that weren't a fit for our core business. Uh, things related to startups, things related to some of the ERP things that we do that we're enabling other parts of the business, but did not necessarily fit in with the core mission of those companies. We spent several years just deterring those or uh, passing on those opportunities to third parties. Um, we had development opportunities, product concepts, those kind of uh, applications. So 2009, what we decided to do was instead of just continuously taking these opportunities and passing them on as freebies to everybody else, let's see if we can put together a small crack team of very exceptional people who, when these opportunities come around, are able to capitalize on them. I'm a firm believer that a small team of really excellent people, I call them one in tenors, a small team of one in tenors can accomplish what very large teams cannot. Um, you, you can you know, grab one of the big four accounting firms or consulting firms and they'll bring in 14 people and they'll spend three years trying to come up with the same ideas, concepts, processes, developments, products, that two or three or four great people in a room focused on what they're doing, can accomplish at the same time. Um, I've been preaching this to my board, to my ownership, to all the other departments for 10 years. Uh, don't focus on everything. Focus on the core and get the right people to solve that problem perfectly. If you can solve your core, you can flourish out from there. Um, but MMLT served as the first chance I could actually put that in practice on my own. So I, along with a... Uh, Tim Chamberlain, Darren Kelkoff, and Mark Meeks, Mark Meeks uh, we uh, kind of uh, threw the idea back and forth a little bit, uh, got together one night uh, over a cup of coffee, everybody wrote a $1,500 check, and uh, we started MMLT. Uh, not really quite sure exactly what we were going to do, but we knew that success favored the prepared, and if we were able to put ourselves in a position to take advantage of opportunities when they came along, um, we thought we could do very well with that. Um, not really knowing the step two at the time, but knowing that we had to do something to allow step two to take place. So that's how we started MMLT. We incorporated, got things set up, and then kind of waited. So uh, can you talk about any of the clients that you provide services for or anything? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, I guess uh, yes and no. Yeah. <laughs> MMLT is a very kind of special company. We, uh, we're in the business of starting up startups. As time went on through 2009, 2010, we kind of developed very quickly a niche market. Um, and what that is, is we enable other companies to very quickly go from napkin to launch. More or less, I have an idea, I think I have an idea, I have something that looks like an idea, I have a drawing at least. I have some loose concepts, um, but I don't know more than it necessarily. A lot of times it's an idea guy or a money guy. 
and I want this, and I know where I want to go with it. The details uh, is where the devil is, obviously. So what we focus on, uh, about 60% of our client, our revenue, is helping startups go from napkin to launch. And really what that is is, you know, literally that. We quite often have people come in with, you know, here's a napkin of an idea. Um, we help them through the product development concepts, uh, the thoughts of business development, uh, Series A financing from time to time, uh, and putting them in contact with the things that we can't do necessarily, and pushing that forward. So with MMLT, that's really where a lot of our focus is. Now, that being said, who do we do this for? Well, we're the magic behind other people's big bang, more or less. Uh, we're the, the thing that's hidden up the skirt, more or less. So we don't really get to publicize who our major successes are. Um, we do uh, a lot of magic for a lot of people. Um, we've got a few clients we can go out there and, and talk about, uh, but for the most part, we're kind of a hidden secret. Um, we don't have a whole lot of clients. We, we never really bring on more than about 10 at a time, and everything we're looking at is really long-term partnerships. Um, startups, obviously, in particular, are just uh, you know highly risky. Um, even for a company that's doing work with a startup, you're dealing with cash flow issues with these guys continuously. You're dealing with the fact this company may not exist the next day. Uh, you're dealing with a lot of uncertainty, a lot of highly mobile people, a lot of uh, changing situations. So startups are a very interesting company to work with. A lot of companies won't work with startups. They don't have credit. They don't have establishment. They don't have uh, a pile of money you know, quite often sitting around. So you're working with them day to day, week to week, month to month to kind of establish their vision, their plan, and hopefully through our expertise with technology platforms um, and just you know, the fact we've been doing this for a long time, guiding them into the right direction. Um, so who do we do it for? We do it for a lot of people. Not a whole lot of people we can talk about, so unfortunately. how do you protect yeah. yourself against sort of, you know, working with a startup, you know it doesn't have a lot of money, and, you know, any given time they won't be able to pay the bills. Like, how do you protect yourself against that? Trust. It, it's weird. It, it, it's very, very hard. Um, it's why we only have a few clients at a time. Um, there's, you know, St. Louis is actually, uh, it's been our experience, you know, this through word of mouth. We don't do any advertising, but we've got a lot of ideas uh, floating around. There are a lot of people looking for, um, pushing that idea forward. It's surprising. Ideas are not that rare. Money is actually not that rare. The hardest thing to find in St. Louis, I think this is probably most markets right now, is the talent to accomplish those ideas. That's the scarcity. Um, this goes back to my one in 10 concept. You can hire 10 people. Um, you know, Maybe they're all very average developers. Those 10 people locked in a room for a month could very easily accomplish nothing. You find the right people with the right mindset. One or two people can do what those 10 people cannot do in that same timeline. That's the difference between launching a product and folding. What we bring to the table is that special talent, the ability to have an idea that's not fully fleshed out and take it from napkin to launch. Um, the trust on the other side there is, yeah, how do we get paid for this? It, it's, very, it's very challenging. Um, you know, we're not client-vendor kind of relationships. It's much more partners. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got to get in there. We have to trust the owners. The owners have to trust us. Um, and it's a communication. It's the same as with your marriage or anything else. You talk, and then you talk some more. When you're done talking, you talk to them again. You have to be in a situation where if they're having issues, they're not afraid to tell you. Same way if you're having issues with me and their deadlines or product developments, you have to be talking to them. It's constantly a two-way street, and hopefully if you develop that relationship, it works. If you don't, uh, same thing with hiring. You can't be afraid to cut the cord. Uh, if it's a bad partnership, you may be making money off of it, but in the long term, it's going to burn you. Um, the same thing with a, a hire. You get a bad hire, he may be accomplishing some things, but he's going to be that rotten, ab that rotten apple eventually. Uh, you just got to cut the cord. Um, luckily, we haven't been burned. Um, we do, uh, you, know, you got to stay on top of, you know, basic business. Your accounts receivables are always out there. You got to be looking at them, you got to be bouncing them, you got to be bouncing your cash flow, looking at your payables. Um, but mainly so it's communication. What challenges do you, do you have facing 2013? Uh, for us, it's. Probably with most small businesses, it's the constant boom bust cycle. Um, you know, besides you know the, the fun parts of accounts payables and payroll and everything else, uh, challenges go from being um, we're a little slow this month to next month. My God, I need to hire four more people, and that's not possible. Uh, the constant challenge is how to level that out. You know, as what we do is providing special talent to companies. Uh, unfortunately, companies don't level out their needs uh, based upon our projections necessarily. 
Uh, so the biggest challenge we have is how to constantly balance that. Um, our number one cost is payroll, obviously. Um, you know, so we have to constantly manage our internal resources with our clients need and managing expectations across the board. Uh, 2013, 2012 actually have been fantastic years. Uh, you know, we started MMLT in 2009, um, not the absolute worst year to start, that was 2008, but 2009 was pretty bad as well. Uh, you know, so we started in the, you know, valley of the recession more or less. So we've seen nice steady growth every year from there. Um, I guess that's the benefit of starting at the bottom. But uh, the biggest challenge this year is continue safe, healthy growth and bring on the clients that make sense and the, and the partnerships that make sense for both of us to succeed. So is your team growing and are you hiring? Yes and yes, <laughs> always. Um, you know, better, you know, any small business, it's the same thing. It, it's cliche almost, but you're either growing or you're shrinking. You're never staying the same. Uh, so either you're going to become a bigger company, a better company, or you're going to become a smaller company, a leaner company. Uh, so we are growing, but it's always measured growth. Uh, you know, we try to keep purposely our growth down to below 50% a year. Uh, for a small company, that can actually be hard sometimes. Uh, you have to say no as often as you say yes. It, that can be quite challenging when you're looking at revenue out there. Uh, but it, our entire model only works if we've got the one in 10 people, the special people to make magic happen. Uh, when we started MMLT, we knew back in 2009 that there was no way we'd ever be a big company. Uh, the reality is there's not many great people out there. One in 10 people are amazing. Eight out of 10 people are average. One out of 10 is terrible. Uh, the rest of people hopefully leave the industry. A great programmer can accomplish literally in a day what it takes an average programmer a week or two to accomplish, what it takes a bad programmer a month or more to accomplish. Uh, it's a very unique industry that way because you have absolute orders of magnitude difference between your talent levels. If you're able to find those great people, those one in 10ers, and build a team around them, you're in a position where you can do amazing things for your clients. Once you lose that focus and you go to that next level, you, you know, you, if you get 30 people, if you get 40 people, you don't have 41 intenders. You have five one intenders, a bunch of average people, and probably a bad apple or two. You can make money that way, but that's not the way we want to make money. Um, you know, so growth is important, but managed very, so very tightly. What do you look for when you're hiring these new, new talent? And do you have a hard time finding this technical talent in St. Louis? <laughs> uh, it, it's cliche at this point. I mean, you go to any startup blog or any uh, entrepreneurial, you know, workshop, uh, everybody's always constantly talking about the rock stars. Nowadays. It's the same concept, the one in tenors, the rock stars, the A-teamers. Um, you know, every startup in the world, as part of their mission statement, says they're only going to hire those people. Uh, you know, this wasn't a clear thing 10 years ago. It is today. Um, the reality is, though, it, it's very, very hard to do. The people you want on your team are never looking for a job. They don't. They're not on dice. They're not submitting resumes. The people you want, you're only going to give them because you know somebody who knew them from where they're at right now, or vice versa. <coughs> One of the main things I've been able to accomplish in my last 13, 14 years in this company, um, or in this industry, is really, I hate to put it this way, but collecting people. One of the main things I bring to the table anywhere I'm at is my network of amazing talent that I can bring to bear on a problem for a client or for a partner. Um, you know, it's taken me 15 years to find six guys that can do that. Uh, if I'm lucky in the next 15 years, I might find six more. So yes, it's incredibly challenging. Um, hiring the right people makes all the difference in the world. What advice do you have for founders who are starting a new company? Uh, it's, it's terribly hard. Um, you see, you know, we come into this from a unique, different position. You know, over the years now, I've, I've been involved with startups in California um, for the e-commerce world here in St. Louis um, and with MMLT directly. Um, it's tough. It, it is incredibly tough. You have to be a little bit silly to do it. Again, you're going to, you know, fall back to all the cliches here, but um, you're, you're not quite sure what the next days are going to bring you. Um, on the flip side there, if you have a passion, if you have a dream, if you really know what you want to go after out there, it has to be more than the money because the money maybe probably won't ever come. You have to find the reward someplace else. Um, for me, it was a vision of having a small crack team be able to accomplish on a regular basis miracles um, and, and, and focus that and hone that and do that again and again. Uh, if that's what your goal is, if you have a dream other than the monetary side of it, it can be very, very rewarding. Um, 
but also it's going to go from uh, huge valleys and, 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 <laughs> and peaks uh, everywhere from, you know, today, my God, how am I going to meet payroll to tomorrow? Uh, this is the best day I've ever had. Uh, until the day after that, uh, I have another, you know, huge uh, loss. Uh, you know, so there's definitely no steady to it. It's, it's huge peaks and valleys. Uh, it can be very exciting, but it can also be very tiring. Have, have you guys, at your company, have you uh, taken any funding or had to raise any money? We're very lucky. Uh, the situation we are in, uh, we were able to quite literally start with uh, a couple thousand dollars. Now, all the founders wrote a $1,500 check, and we were able to take that and grow it very methodically. Um, from that to, uh, you know, we were profitable our first year and have maintained a pretty significant profit uh, margin every year since then over, you know, very careful growth uh, and careful um, looks, you know, watching the accounts payable always. Now, our business is unique. We're in the service industry, actually. Uh, we're not a pure technology company. You know, on the other side, we've helped a lot of our clients work through that Series A and a Series B funding where you have to go out there and, you know, it's not raising 50000 it's raising 500000 and raising that $2 million and, you know, getting it out there. Um, depending upon the business you're in, if you're out there, you know, client acquisitions is very expensive. You know, uh, e-commerce or anything in the social media world, you're looking anywhere from 8 to $12 per user acquisition costs. Uh, so if you're in those worlds, that's where all your money's going. It's all in marketing and client acquisition. Um, if you're in pure technology play, you're in developers and development. Um, so, that, you know, money can be tough. But it has been my experience that the ideas are free, free flowing out there. Money, if you're serious, you got your stuff together, you have a coherent package that you can present and a roadmap to victory. Money is not that hard to find, it's talent. You have to have the talent, the engineering capabilities to pull it off. Uh, and it's not just technology talent, it, it's, it's creative talent, it's business talent, it's people being competent and hopefully above competent in each one of their areas of expertise. And that is actually, unfortunately, very hard to find in any area. Um, like I said, you know, the special people you want to build your business on are never looking for you. You have to go out there and find them somehow. If you're lucky enough, you find a couple and you pull them together. Well, I, I will say this. I have a, a, a few key things that I think to apply to any startup. And this is for technology-based, service-based, wherever your company is. These principles I, I, I see repeatable time and time again. I will wrap it up with a summary first. I preach to my guys, to my clients, to my customers, I preach to everybody continuously a very simple phrase. Do it, do it right, and get it done. Um, my engineers hate it. I will literally bark that at them once a day. But it covers three of the most important aspects of what we do, of what anybody does. Product development, service, taking care of clients. You do it, you do it right, you get it done. What does that mean? Do it. The number one enemy of success is indecision across the board. I've seen more things fail, be it companies, products, ideas, concepts, projects, due to indecision. The difference in success between an 85% the way correct answer and a 95% the way incorrect answer is minimal compared to never making that decision. People will sit there and debate for weeks, for months, sometimes for years upon which direction to go. What color should our logo be? How should this application behave? What name should we choose? You know, decision one, two, three, four, five, six. So instead of making a decision, we get caught in this indecision world. Well, if you never make a decision, you'll never move forward. And this happens time and time and time again. I constantly see people caught up on making long-term processes at what should be short decisions. I preached to all my guys, um, from the very top of the company down to the interns, make decisions. You will make decisions. One day you will make the wrong decision. If it's a big enough wrong decision, you will get fired for it. But you will have made decisions and you will move on and you can stand by that. The people who don't want to make decisions and just constantly want to cover themselves, those are the bad apples. Get rid of those people. Get people who are willing to make decisions and move forward. So that's the do it part. Make a decision and do it. Second part there is do it right. Now, when we talk about some decisions like should this logo be red or green or blue or red? Those aren't right or wrong decisions. Those are just pick a color and go with it. But you have a lot of your decisions where you know the right path forward. It's clear to you, this is what we should do. We should do this. But now I'm gonna start talking myself out. I'm gonna start coming up with concessions to this and workarounds and, and half correct solutions because I don't want to incur the cost 
be it in resources, in money, in time, in whatever your resource is, to do the right path. So we're going to come up with two, three, four workarounds for that. What ends up happening, almost without exception, is I will spend, the resources spend, the team will spend as much time in the end on all these workarounds as what the original solution would have taken, the proper path, that we all knew was the proper path. But so we're going to spend and have the same net expense when we're done with this, but instead of coming out of that process with a great product or a great process, a great solution, a great presentation, whatever it is, we come up with a half-assed solution. Not only that, we've probably lost face with our customer, our client, our internal teams, whatever that, you know, X party is, the entire resource. So not only have we disappointed everybody we're trying to serve, we've come up with this at the same cost of a lesser product, a lesser output. Um, so the second part of it, do it right. You know the right decision. When, you, when it's clear to you, trust your gut and go with that path. It may seem like it's going to be more expensive. It may seem like it's going to cost more. It almost always is the same as doing the wrong way. It just, you end up with a better solution. So do it, do it right. Is get it, and this done. particular applies to engineers. Don't let the best be a deterrent for the better. The most amazing, perfect product that never ships is a wild failure compared to the 90% correct solution that does ship. Engineers love to make things perfect. This has to be perfect before we go live. We will slip our date this week because of this. We will slip our date again next week because of that. There are times where you have to do it right, but also you have to get it done. Those three rules come together. You do it, you do it right, and you get it done, and they go in that order. If you run your decisions, your teams, your company that way, you will continuously succeed, produce, and hopefully iteratively come back and re-accomplish those tasks. Um, I see more companies, big companies, startup companies, mid-sized companies, doing all three of those wrong. Uh, if you can take it, refocus it, do it, do it right, get it done, it's the biggest recipe you have for success.